Good afternoon or good morning and welcome to IT webinar on the IT recommended practice on guidelines for determining traffic signal change and clearance intervals. This is Jeff Pagnotti, IT Executive Director and CEO. I just wanted to kick off the webinar by recognizing and thanking Jeff Lindley, our Chief Technical Officer, and Doug Noble of our Senior, our senior Technical Director with ITE and the many volunteers, IT volunteers, who participated in the development of this recommended practice. As some of you know, this recommended practice was a long time in coming. I know Jeff will talk about it as he gets into his presentation, the, the many years of work that led up to uh, the publication of the recommended practice. Uh, but we're pleased to have published it and make it available uh, for professionals. We have tried in the development of the recommended practice to balance between theory and the practical application of that theory out in the real world. And Jeff will talk about that as he goes through the presentation. This webinar has been set up uh, through collaboration with the IT Public Agency Council and is being held exclusively for our public sector members. We thought it was important for you all to be able to hear from us about this new recommended practice and so we've set up this webinar and we're pleased that we have more than 250 attendees right now and I think something over 300 that uh, we expect to hit at the peak of this uh, webinar. Uh, we encourage your questions. Uh, if you have questions, please use the chat box and choose the option to send questions to staff. That will allow us to queue them up appropriately and get to as many questions as we can uh, during the webinar. I know one of the early questions was asking about availability of the presentation. I wanted to let you know that this session will be recorded and will be available for um, download to listen to. We will also be posting a PDF of the presentation afterwards. Uh, I just want to check if I could um, and make sure the sound is okay. We've got a, a couple people that have so if someone, yeah, there we go, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, all right, we'll go on and get started. So let me turn the presentation over to Jeff. Okay, thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Colin, if you could go to the next slide. Um, what we're gonna try and do over the next 20 minutes or so uh, is to give you a little bit of background and history on the development of the recommended practice, uh, talk a little bit about purpose and intended use uh, we'll talk a little bit about the scope, uh, spend a good chunk of time on the recommendations that are either a significant departure from current practice or a significant confirmation of current practice. We'll talk uh, about some additional research that's needed and about the resources that will um, that are currently available on the website to help you. Uh, and that should take up about half the hour that we have, so we'll have about half the time for questions and comments, if you have any. Can other people please tell me if you can hear the audio or not? We've gotten some confirmation that some can and others cannot. Okay. I think we're good. Okay, I think we're good. Sorry <laughs> no, about no more that. Comments. We know there's a lot of Thank you online. You. Appreciate all the all the folks. Wow. Now, no audio through the computer, but I can hear it on the phone. Okay. 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 You, it could be your local mute is on, or some other things are going on. So, okay, there we go. We can hear it via computer. All right, we're going to keep going. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, Colin. So just a little bit about the background and history. Um, we've been asked through this process whether we're replacing an existing ITE recommended practice on this subject, and there is no current ITE recommended practice in this area. Uh, we have tried over the last 30 plus years uh, to develop a recommended practice, but we've never been able to reach a consensus. Uh, the current effort uh, is about 12 years old. It began in 2007, started with a survey of current practice that was conducted in 2009. Uh, we took a little bit of a detour and hiatus while an NCHRP study was completed in 2012. And for the last 
four years or so, we've been trying to finalize the recommended practice and resolve a lot of comments that we, we received as part of the process. Uh, the very last step of that was to use an appeals panel uh, back late last summer to resolve eight remaining issues uh, that were unable to be resolved through the, through the comment resolution process. Uh, so the final recommended practice was approved by the board in January, and it's been available since Friday. It was just announced yesterday, but it's been on the website since Friday. So just a few words about the purpose and intended use. The recommended practice, as you it is, should be obvious, is intended to assist practitioners in developing reasonable times for yellow change and red clearance intervals for traffic signals. Um, however, the, the, um, those calculations or recommendations that come from the formula that we'll talk about, you know, need to be grounded and supplemented by engineering judgment to make sure there's an appropriate balance between the theory uh, and the practical application of that theory. The other thing I'll mention, which is another question that comes up quite a bit, um, more outside ITE than inside ITE, but ITE recommended practices are voluntary standards which agencies adopt at their discretion. Uh, so it's not a mandatory um, standard, it's a voluntary standard. So the scope of the recommendations, and let me tell you a little bit about if you haven't looked at the recommended practice, how it's put together, there is the, the, the largest portions of the recommended practice. Chapter two uh, contains a description of current practice and optional methods for uh, calculating and considering various aspects of, of the process of calculating uh, change in clearance intervals. And then it concludes with a recommendation in each one of those sections. Those recommendations are then summarized in Chapter three, which is some might might view as the recommended practice itself, but there's a lot more um, information in there uh, to support those recommendations, uh, results of the survey, uh, various research that's been done over the years, and as we'll get to later, some additional research that still needs to be undertaken. Um, the scope of the recommendations follows, um, the left side of this slide is mostly elements of the formulas. Uh, so the calculation method is talked about quite a bit, uh, how it applies to through and turning movements, and then what the various variables are in the equations. The material on the right side of the slide are largely other related issues, minimum and maximum intervals, rounding, and so on that are uh, related to, but not part of the, the formulation of the recommendations. So we'll spend the next little bit uh, talking about the items on this slide. Um, we're gonna talk some about the extended kinematic equation as the basis for calculations for change intervals. Uh, we're gonna talk about application of the kinema extended kinematic equation to left turn movements and right turn movements. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of speed data and assumptions about speed data. And then we're going to talk a little bit about intersection width enforcement and again about use of engineering judgment. So what you see on the screen here is the traditional kinematic equation for calculating yellow change and red clearance intervals. Um, and that is uh, the basis uh, it's used by um, about half of the jurisdictions that responded to our survey. Uh, so it's in, it's in pretty wide, but, but not uh, universal use for calculating change in clearance intervals. And it's typically used uh, for all movements. It's typically used to calculate uh, change in clearance intervals for through movements, as well as turning movements. And as you can see, the yellow change interval is a uh, combination of percep perception and reaction time, that's the T variable, and then a combination of approach speed, 
uh, deceleration, comfortable deceleration and grade at the uh, intersection. And then the red clearance interval uh, also uses um, approach speed, but the width of the intersection, an assumed length of the vehicle, and a startup time delay term as well. The red clearance calculation uh, for the traditional kinematic equation and the extend or the extended kinematic equation that we'll see on the next slide are identical. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about at least one of the one of the terms later on. Uh, but I'm going to spend more time talking about the difference between the traditional kinematic equation and the extended formulation uh, for calculating change intervals. So if you go to the next slide, Colleen, the the extended kinematic equation is an equation that was developed and it's designed to take into account the slowing that occurs um, during turning movements as vehicles approach an intersection. And so you'll see that it's a little bit more complicated formulation. Uh, it uses pretty much the same variables as the uh, traditional kinematic equation, but a little bit different formulation. And um, the biggest change is the addition of that term in the center of the equation. And that term and a, a slight reformulation of the, of the third term in the equation are what account for the slowing that takes place during turning movements. Um, the other thing you'll notice about this equation is that if the approach speed, V85, and the intersection entry speed, V sub E, are identical, which they would be for a turning movement, the equation reduces back to the traditional kinematic equation. So through movement. For through movement. So for a through movement, uh, V85 and, and V are the same. That middle term zeroes out. VE in that case becomes the, the approach speed V85. And it's, it's exactly the same for a through movement. For a turning movement though, use of this equation will add additional time to account for that, that slowing at the intersection. And if you go to the next slide, Colleen, I, this will show you uh, or demonstrate the um, sort of the magnitude of that change. At slower speeds and an approach speed of, of 30 miles an hour, and you, you see the assumptions about the other terms uh, down below the table. At an approach speed of 30 miles an hour, um, it's about a half a second, a little over a half a second using the traditional kinematic, kinematic equation and the extended kinematic equation to calculate a change interval. As speeds get higher, that difference in calculation between the two equations increases. So at an approach speed of 50 miles an hour, uh, the difference is a little bit over two seconds. So a much more significant um, difference in the, in the clearance uh, interval that is calculated. So the recommended practice <coughs> recommends, it makes recommendations for both through movements and turning movements. And it essentially recommends that you use the extended kinematic equation for both. But as I said, the, for through movements, the extended equation reduces to the traditional equation. So that is the formulation that folks are used to. When you apply it to left turn movements, again, it's going to add time uh, to account for that slowing as vehicles prepare to turn. So the recommendation in the, in the recommended practice is to use the extended kinematic equation to calculate um, change intervals for left turning movements. For protected turning movements, you simply calculate it uh, and cap, the, um, cap it at seven seconds if necessary. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. And for permissive turning movements, the recommendation is to calculate the change interval for both the through movement and the turning movement, capping the turning movement at seven seconds if necessary, and then a, a select an appropriate change interval between those two values 
uh, using engineering judgment and considering a number of factors at the intersection, uh, such as left turn volumes, approach speed, intersection geometry, and, and others as appropriate. Um, one of the things I think that will get some attention in this, uh, in our recommendation here, is the seven second maximum. And because the, you know, you plug the numbers into the extended kinematic equation, and at approach speeds higher than 50 miles an hour, um, it will calculate uh, recommended change intervals that are in excess of seven seconds. Uh, as many of you know, there has been a long standing uh, concern in this um, topic area of, about extended uh, yellow change intervals and their potential uh, adverse uh, impact on safety. Uh, we were not able during the development of the recommended practice to um, find much research that supported that concern, but it is a long-standing concern and it's very easy uh, to um, to see how that might become an issue. And so in our judgment, we felt like um, longer clearance intervals were warranted for turning movements, uh, were a good practice, uh, extending those uh, clearance, those change intervals beyond seven seconds because we don't know what the safety uh, impacts of that might be. We didn't feel like it was prudent to go beyond seven seconds, which is why we've we've uh, made a recommendation that those change intervals be capped at seven seconds. For right turning movements, um, the kinematic equation um, you know works for right turning movements as well as as left turning movements. The the issue is that um, right turning movements. Uh, and again, there isn't a ton of research uh, in this in this area, but right turning movements are complicated, and they're different than left turning movements in that uh, you have to turn slower, typically. You have to um, be alert for uh, cross traffic and for pedestrians when you turn. And in a lot of cases, you're already slowing uh, as you reach the critical distance where you would decide to stop or go at the intersection. So there's a lot of things that we don't fully understand about right turns. Uh, and because of the slower, um, the slower speed of the turning movement, um, the extended kinematic equation would calculate, in some cases, very long clearance intervals for right turns. And we decided not to make a recommendation that was separate for right turning movement. Uh, so the recommendation is to base the change interval on the, the change interval calculated for the decision made for a change interval for the through and left turn movements, and um, which we believe should safely accommodate right turning vehicles. But when we get to the research that's being recommended, we also believe there's some work to do there as well. Um, so based on the explanation so far, you should have, uh, um, you know, you should have caught that that uh, there's a significant influence in the formulation on the assumptions that are made about speed, both approach speed and intersection entry speed. So we've recommended that actual speeds be used wherever possible. Wherever you have speed data, it's best to use. Uh, real data instead of assumptions. However, recognizing that you won't have actual speed data in all cases, uh, there are assumptions uh, that are listed in the recommended practice and listed on the slide that can be made for through movement approach uh, and intersection entry speed as well as left turning uh, movement approach and intersection entry speed. Uh, the topic of intersection width, in the end, uh, we, we did not make any uh, significant changes to uh, recommended uh, practice um, that are different from current practice. It was a topic that was discussed uh, quite heavily during the process. 
Uh, intersection width is typically measured from the near side stop bar to the far side uh, intersection uh, edge, um, as shown on the slide for both um, through movements and turning movements. Um, however, in places where there are significant pedestrian volumes, uh, we do make a recommendation that consideration be given to extending that intersection width to the far side, to the far side of the far side crosswalk, uh, which will add a little bit to the all red clearance time, but will um, make it safer for pedestrians at the intersection. Enforcement. Um, the recommended practice itself does not cover enforcement actions, either through traditional or automated means at any level of detail. Uh, we felt like it was our, our job to um, develop recommendations for uh, how to appropriately calculate change in clearance intervals. Uh, however, we do make a statement about enforcement particularly as it relates to automated enforcement, which is a recognition that the factors in the formula uh, actually represent a range of behavior, almost every factor in the formula. Perception reaction time is assumed to be one second in most cases. It, there's actually a range. Uh, comfortable deceleration is assumed to be 10 feet per second per second in most cases it's actually a range. Approach speeds, as you know, are a distribution of speeds. That's also a range. And so enforcing uh, red light violations with zero tolerance, as soon as the signal turns red, uh, any fraction of a second uh, into the red, uh, and doing enforcement on that basis is probably not a good idea. It doesn't recognize that the um, calculation of change intervals using um, variables that are actually made up of a range of behavior um, doesn't recognize uh, the inexact um, science of, of, of calculating and implementing, implementing an appropriate change interval. Um, we did discover along the way of having this discussion that ITE does not have a um, policy in the area of automated enforcement. Uh, so we drafted one uh, that the board has approved for circulation for comment. The comment period actually just closed on, on Friday, but the proposed policy, this isn't word for word, but it strongly supports automated enforcement for the purposes of improved safety, uh, but not for a goal of raising revenue, and the board will consider that for final adoption as an IT policy at their meeting in April. Um, I mentioned engineering judgment. Uh, there is strong emphasis on the use of engineering judgment throughout the recommended practice. We think it's important that professionals using the recommended practices have a full understanding of the concepts and the associated assumptions and limitations. Uh, we've removed the lookup tables from the recommended practice, uh, so folks wouldn't be tempted to just go to the lookup table and and uh, you know pull a number out of the lookup table and call it good. Uh, we think it's important to both understand and appreciate the concepts and the the limitations of the approach that's being recommended. There's also a strong theme in the recommended practice for documenting decision making. Um, particularly when um, a decision is made to um, depart from whatever the normal practice is in that in that jurisdiction. Uh, we talked about uh, key areas for additional research. Uh, they're listed here on the slide. There's also an article in the current uh, edition of IT Journal that goes into a little bit more detail uh, on these as well as a uh, similar listing in the recommended practice itself. Um, and I think the article in the journal leads off by saying you would think after 90 years we know all there is to know about this topic. And we really don't. Uh, there's not a lot of 
documented research on safety benefits of yellow change and red clearance intervals. Uh, as I said earlier, there's very little on the impact on, on driver behavior and safety of longer change intervals, and by longer we define that as greater than five seconds. Uh, there's a lot going on at turning movements that we don't understand. Uh, how the turning movement itself affects perception reaction time, decelerated deceleration rates, and approach uh, speeds and passage speeds through the intersection. Um, because speed is so important, uh, we think there needs to be more research on data collection methods for capturing approach and intersection entry speeds. Uh, what folks will say, and, and I have some sympathy for, is, well, we don't have speed data because it's too hard and it's too expensive to collect. So we think that's a ripe area for research as well. And there are others that are described in more detail in the journal article and in the recommended practice. Um, so last slide, uh, resources. Uh, if you go to the website uh, under technical resources, um, there are a number of things that we put together that uh, to try and help you as you try to navigate the recommended practice and implement the recommendations. Uh, the recommended practice itself is available for purchase through the website. Uh, as I said, it's a 100-page plus document that not only includes the recommended practices, but a, a lot of background information as well. Uh, the IT journal articles, the three articles on this topic, are, are reprinted uh, on the website. Uh, there are a couple of papers that were used to support derivation and use of the extended kinematic equation that were submitted during the appeals process. Uh, if you want to get into the math and, and understand how that equation was developed and how it should be used, uh, there's resources there uh, for that. Uh, we've included some frequently asked questions, questions we think you'll be asked that will be asked about the recommended practice and how it should be used. Um, those are available to you, and we will update those as we get additional, additional questions. And then, as Jeff said, we'll post this presentation on the website, and we are uh, in the process of trying to develop a version of this presentation that can be used at IT district section and chapter meetings that would um, um, be useful for explaining <coughs> uh, the recommended practice to our members. Go ahead, Colleen. And now we're to the question. So we have a number of questions that have come in while Jeff has given the presentation and I'll try to work our way through those. Um, and the first actually was a comment, uh, Jeff, and it was with regard to your statement about what the traditional practice is. And the comment is several would argue that what you described as a traditional kinematic equation used by practitioners wasn't exactly right, that most do not use startup delay and usually not 85th percentile speed and that that was, um, the survey demonstrated that as well. So I don't know uh, if we want to comment on it. I think there are probably variations mm -hmm. of the traditional kinematic equation that are used by practitioners in different ways is probably the, yeah. um, the way to frame that. Yeah, and that was supported by, and Doug Noble's here as well, and that was, I believe, supported. You know, I said, um, you know, it's it's um, uh, it's going to be like the Democratic Convention. A plurality of of mm -hmm. uh, of people use some version of the extended kinematic equation. Um, what the survey showed was there are a lot of other methods and policies that people use as well. But but I would acknowledge that there are variations uh, in terms of what speed assumptions. Um, people make and whether or not they use the startup delay for the red clearance that um, that I would characterize as as variations of the extended kinematic equation. Sure. But you're right; there's not just one way to okay. do it. Um, so there are a variety of questions related to speed. 
Uh, one, there's a growing push to get away from setting speed limits based on the 85th percentile because it can foster higher speeds than appropriate for the context. Was this considered in developing the recommended practice? Uh, so you might talk about the 85th percentile in this context, which I think is a little bit different than in the speed limit setting context. Um, yeah, different and similar. Um, in, in this case, um, the reason for using 85th percentile speeds is, is to ensure that um, you're using a speed that would capture um, most of the um, vehicles using the intersection. It won't capture or it won't accommodate the outliers, that top 15%, but it would capture the um, the vast majority of the of the vehicles using the intersection. Um, if if you use a lower speed, like a target speed or a desired speed, you would actually be decreasing the yellow clearance interval and not capturing uh, as high a percentage as you would by using the eighth percentile. That's where I right. said right. I think it's a little bit different in the application here versus when you're thinking about um, trying to manage speeds in a, in a particular environment. Right, and this, uh, except where you would, if you're using actual speeds, um, you know, it's in, it, it, there's a relation to the speed limit, but what you're actually trying to do is capture the vast majority, you know, a, a, a speed where the vast majority of vehicles would be accounted for in the calculation of the change interval, and that that change interval would would be implemented, you know, to account for those vehicles, whether whether that whether those vehicles are at above or below the speed limit. So, the question going back to the extended kinematic equation, I don't understand the math behind the extended kinematic equation. If a vehicle is slowing <laughs> down then the dilemma zone would be closer to the stop bar and we need less yellow time since the vehicle could stop in less time. Can you please ex explain the theory behind giving more yellow time for vehicles that are slowing down to turn left? It's actually, um, let's see if I, can, if I can answer that quickly, which may not be. Um, the, um, Maybe I can't answer it at all. It's hard to put into words. It, the the dilemma zone, um, what what it actually captures, are are situations where the driver has to make a decision on whether to stop or to proceed before they would be slowing to make the turn. So the you've you've already passed the point where you. Would you, you've already decided I'm stopping or I'm going, and but you still have to slow to make the turn, and it captures that speed reduction that takes place um, between the point where you make that decision and the intersection. In some intersections and at some speeds, that may happen. Uh, the slowing may may need to start before. Um, that decision point, in which case I think the person asked, asked the question is, is correct. And so you want to capture, to calculate a, an appropriate clearance of change interval, at that location you would want to be capturing speeds at that point after the slowing has started. Yeah, the way I, I guess I think about it is if you have two vehicles one in the through lane and one in the left turn lane, and they're going at the same speed, and they uh, make the decision to proceed, that the through vehicle is gonna maintain speed and go through the intersection. The left turning vehicle is gonna have to slow down to navigate that left turn 
and that additional time to slow down to navigate the left turn is what adds to the length of the yellow on the left turn movement. It is a little bit counterintuitive because you think you're slowing down, but actually that slowing down is what adds uh, additional time to navigate through. Uh, we got a whole bunch of questions here. We're I'm trying to look through and get to um, as many as we can. We may have to post some frequently asked questions that, um, in addition to this. For left turning traffic speed, our current practice is to assume 15 mile per hour turning speed. VE in your example is a larger number. You talk about the, the intersection entry speed. Um, if I assume if it's not measured. Yeah, I mean it. It is a. That was, and when you look at Doug, that was chosen uh, as the as the assumed value where there where data isn't available or better assumptions aren't available um, based on prevailing practice more than anything else. So if you have better information or documented assumptions for speeds that are higher or lower, I, I think you should use them. Yeah, our, just to be clear, the, the default assumption here is 20 miles per hour, right? And, but the user is free to adjust that based on knowledge of the local conditions that they have. Absolutely. An, an example would be if you're in a tight urban area, uh, say Milwaukee or something, where very short, small intersections, the turning radius is relatively tight, it's a relatively low speed. If you're on, in a western state like Salt Lake City, very wide intersections, much larger radius, your speed through the turn will be higher. So the, there, there were several questions around the um, use of the longer yellow. Uh, there was a question about whether the uh, Minnesota DOT's experience with drivers learning longer yellows was reviewed as part of this work and how that was used. That's referenced in the... It, it is referenced in, it is, uh, it is referenced in the uh, report and the literature review section and the specific information that has come up regarding longer yellows is not, it, it doesn't pertain in the context of the case we're looking at here in terms of the detail of reading through the entire report. So it's cited, in, it, it and the information is cited. So again, part of the goal here, because there are several other questions were around the question of the MUTCD, whether the MUTCD three to six second will need to change, um, kind of the relationship between the six seconds and the seven seconds we chose. So can you maybe go back over that and um, as to how in the end, we what we learned about the basis for the three to six seconds and in the end, how we chose the seven seconds as the, a practical maximum. Sure. So the, we spent some time going back um, to see if we could find the basis for the three to six second recommendation that's in the MUTCD. And we could not find where that came from, uh, nor, nor could FHWA tell us uh, where that came from. Uh, you know, and part of it is just it's 90 years of practice, um, and so some of the some of the things that um, you know we we assume to be based on research uh, are 
not necessarily based on research that we can find or that we can document. Um, when we looked at the um, the possible clearance intervals that the extended kinematic equation could um, calculate, uh, recognizing that the, the theory of providing additional time for the slowing that occurs during turning movements um, is, is sound in theory, um, you know, we believe that longer clearance intervals for higher speeds was appropriate. But again, we had to, uh, I don't suppose we had to, we could have just let the formula calculate what it would calculate and leave it up to the, um, to the professional. Um, but once the clearance intervals get above second sec seven seconds, which means that the approach speeds are above 50 miles an hour, um, and we um, aren't sure of the safety impacts or the safety disbenefits of those higher clearance intervals based on the available information. Um, we felt like we didn't want to make a recommendation that was any higher than seven seconds. Yeah, and there's clearly concerns, I think, in the comments with, with that seven second level and the uh, impacts that even going to seven seconds and probably six seconds would have in, in uh, certain situations. So I want to reflect uh, that in the, in the discussion. Uh, there's a question, is there a point upstream recommended for the measurement of the 85th percentile speed in the recommended practice? Does it recommend where that, yeah, that should be uh, measured? Yeah, it does. The, I think the phrasing is upstream of the area of influence of the intersection. So it's supposed to be a free flow approach speed uh, in advance of where intersection related influence would occur. Which movement controls the left turn or the through movement in a permitted left? That's up to you. I mean, the recommendation is that you calculate both um, both change intervals. Uh, the change interval for the left turns is almost always going to be higher or perhaps equal. Um, the um, didn't feel like we wanted to make a recommendation that in permissive movements, the left turn uh, change interval always um, um, be the one that was selected because there are situations where there are very few, uh, there are permissive left turns, but very few permissive left turns or other traffic or geometric situations where uh, it, a perfectly valid and rational engineering decision would be to use the use a change interval that was closer to or equal to the, the through movement calculation. Is there any new analysis or recommendation on perception reaction time? Is there anything new used in in this piece of work? No. Um, the NCHRP report that I referenced um, came to the same conclusion that um, that 1.0 seconds is a good um, assumption to make for that value. Again, it, it is a range. Uh, there are perception reaction times of drivers that are lower than that, and some that are higher than that, and some that are quite a bit higher than that. Um, it's a distribution, so you're making an assumption about an average, but it, that report validated the long-standing use of 1.0. And there were some additional papers by Tim Gates that are in the TRB research record as well that support that from the same project. Given that prevalent speeds can vary throughout the day and traffic conditions can change, is there a process for capturing the appropriate speed to use for the entire day? question and the answer is no so that's not something that would be included in the practice not included
would be an interesting research question. Or if an agency decides on a practice that they can document, we'd like to see what it is. There's several questions on that about a recommended practice for determining speed. Uh, well, maybe it's, do you have a recommended practice for determining speed um, in terms of number of samples or 24-hour uh, automatic traffic counts? Is there any? Is there some other um, guidance on that? Mm -hmm. IT does have publications for transportation studies, our manual transportation studies, in terms of collecting speed data. Uh, it's also been in our traffic engineering handbooks, including our most recent one. Have there been any updates on accommodating bicycles at signalized intersections? Is that addressed in any way in this? There, there are, there are some. Uh, recommendations regarding bicycles, primarily on clearance, uh, clearance interval at intersections. It's under the uh, special considerations or other considerations along with uh, enforcement and wide intersections like single point diamonds. There's a subsection in the recommendations for that. Would not the perception reaction time for left turning drivers be lower than through because they are already slowing? What one of one of the and, and the answer I would give is that be seems logical and maybe. But that is one of the specific research issues that was raised because the information on on that question um, doesn't really exist. Um, but you would assume that, and what, what's referred to in the recommended research, that an alerted driver uh, making a turn uh, would be more fully prepared to react when the yellow signal indication is displayed. Uh, but the data and research to support that um, still needs to be done. I, th I think that is one of the things that you know was uncovered by this was the need for, as Jeff outlined in the presentation, some additional research in a number of areas. And we hope that the recommended practice and the identification of that research will cause that research to be done, which would allow us at some point to update the recommended practice based on that research. Um, let's see. Do you have any recommendations for, oh, it must, A, it must be acceleration, deceleration. Should this be based on vehicles or trucks if truck percentage is high? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, um, I think you, you definitely have to look at the traffic mix. Uh, I think the assumption that is made largely today and that 10 feet per second per second recommendation if there's no other information available is based on passenger vehicle. Um, but if there, you know, if you have information uh, and a, a traffic mix that is different than predominantly uh, passenger vehicles, I would definitely make an adjustment. Uh, there's a couple questions about on the research side. If there's need for additional research, why wasn't a call or a pooled fund, pooled fund study put out? And why publish now before the research proposed research occurs? Well, as Jeff said, I think what we're trying to reflect here is um, recommendations that are based on what we, you know, the best recommendations and our best judgment on recommendations that we could make 
with the information at hand, with the research that does exist. And as, as he said, that if the research is done, we are certainly open to and would intend to uh, adjust the recommended practice to reflect the results of that research. Yeah, and, and recognize this is something that uh, we have been asked to produce for over a dozen years by our members, uh, that there have been a couple of attempts to capture this, and we felt that the best way to move the practice forward was to capture the knowledge that we have today and to identify the knowledge that we need. What happens once longer yellows are implemented and it's discovered that safety is negatively impacted and how would we ever go back? Shorter yellows would be perceived as less safe regardless of data. I think if we have evidence that longer yellows are in fact creating more crashes, we will have no problem advocating and publishing a recommended practice that is in the interest of improving safety. Um, so, let's see. Go back. So we had some questions regarding the um, the PDF and the ability to share it. So the PDF was produced in a rights uh, restricted manner to avoid it just being widely distributed uh, across large you know, groups. We certainly recognize that within an office, you may per want to purchase it and may, and you have the ability to print from it, and you may want to share that information within you know, a small office. I think we got a question, I have a 10-person office. If I purchase it, can I share it within that office? Certainly. What we have to do is protect the intellectual property produced here and just widespread distribution beyond that. So we've tried to balance between the two as, as we do with all of our publications and as all organizations that produce uh, products try to do. Um, we do have um, discounts available for bulk purchases in large organizations. So um, we please contact us for that information. Uh, we're getting close to the, the time here, so I want to look through and see if there are some uh, other questions that we haven't got to. Is there a recommended all red cap? In rural areas, the intersection is large to cross, which may result in more than five seconds of all red. There's no maximum recommendation. You can speak up. Yeah. Um, we're, we're thinking of it as we go. I don't believe there's a maximum recommendation for a minimum or a maximum recommendation for the all red period. But the engineering judgment clause certainly applies. I think we've got through the majority of the questions. We will go back through, since there are a lot of questions here, we'll go back through and um, look at any that we did not address. Um, add them to the frequently asked questions, which are available on the web page. And, um, and hopefully those will address all of the questions that, that you've asked. Uh, is there, here's one, is there a detailed explanation of the theory behind the extended kinematic equation that will or is, be, is published somewhere? Sure. So there will be a, or there is a, um, one of the features in this month's IT journal is a, is a explanation of how that formula is derived and what it means. Uh, what's posted on the website uh, are 
are two papers that were submitted as part of the appeals process, both of which cover the derivation and use of the extended kinematic equation that are more detailed than the, the IT journal article. Is there a minimum yellow and minimum red clearance time for any intersection? Uh, the minimum yellow, I believe we have, um, I believe what we articulate is the MUTCD minimum of 30 seconds. Uh, there is no minimum all red. Uh, in fact, that, that was an issue that there was some discussion during the appeals process that should the all red be a minimum of one second was was the discussion, and the um, argument was made by a public agency that that if it calculates out to be less than one second, we should be able to implement less than one second, and that's the reason for there being no minimum articulated in the recommended practice. I think that's sort of a corollary. If the yellow change interval is designed to accommodate a wider range of vehicles or drivers, could not an argument be made that the red clearance interval can be made shorter? No, it's the, uh, the, there's the red clearance interval is is designed to let me back up. The yellow change interval is designed to get you into the intersection before the signal turns red, and the red clearance interval is designed to clear the intersection, have the vehicle clear the intersection. Um, you know, both of those are based on a range of behavior. Um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, if you accommodate more in the um, in the calculation of the change interval that you could necessarily um, reduce the length of the red clearance interval as a result of that. I think there are two different portions of the calculation. So I, we, we are out of time and we are gonna need to stop here. We will go through, as I said, uh, the questions that you submitted. I appreciate it. there were a lot of them and I tried to get through as many different kinds of questions and different aspects of the questions. Uh, but we will go back through and over the questions and add to our uh, frequently asked questions and try to address, be as comprehensive as we can in addressing the questions that you post, posted. It'll also be helpful to us as we do a second webinar, which will be open to all um, IT members, which will be on March 19th to um, add to the presentation that we've done and uh, to address, again, issues you've raised as part of that presentation. I thank you for joining us today and um, you know, continue to look for more information on the um, ITE webpage about um, this particular subject.